Warning, this is not entertainment. You talk like a madman. But I live like a sailor. What you don't understand is that it's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. You have it It's better to live on your feet than to die on your knees. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. The dollar buys a nickel for it. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. The air is unfit to breathe. Our food is unfit to eat. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living room. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel belt and radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. Hello, welcome to Eschaton. We're back. If you caught the last episode, you know that was far from a certain thing. I uh, left a request at the beginning of the last episode for those who didn't catch it, uh, for folks to just reach out via email or via review in Apple Podcasts or elsewhere. Just uh, you know, letting me know if you're still engaged with the podcast, uh, what you like, what you don't like. Really, just asking for candid feedback. The reason for that wasn't you know me looking for accolades or praise. I really just wanted to make sure um, you know that the podcast was you know, something that you still found value in and more importantly, that the direction we were going, the topics we've been covering are things you find of interest because over the last four years, Eschaton has gone down a lot of different rabbit holes, a lot of avenues that I didn't really expect to go down when the podcast started. So, um, you know, some good, some bad in terms of listener perception, I think. Um, but anyway, I wanted to bring it back and just level set with you guys and make sure that, you know, the podcast is still something that you enjoy and, you know, that it's worth being part of your repertoire of, of podcasts and uh, shows that you listen to. So all that to say, we're still here, which is a good sign. Um, I put out that call to action and a lot of people reached out. It was really, um, you know, humbling and insightful for me personally. Um, I learned a few things. Uh, number one, I learned that not as many people are listening to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. Um, despite what Libsyn and other, you know, download data aggregators tell me, uh, a lot of folks are listening on various platforms. So I expected, you know, most of our feedback to come via, you know, actual recorded reviews in the podcasting app. But I had far more people email me saying, hey, I don't use Apple Podcasts or I listen through XYZ platform, um, but wanted to let you know, you know, love the show, still engaged, keep up the good work, keep it going. You know, a lot of really uplifting and edifying comments from people and also some really constructive feedback. I mean, I had some folks who were really thoughtful, uh, left me voice recordings and sent those via email. Um, folks sent me personal messages through social media platforms. Um, it, it was a more... Um, heartfelt and, and thoughtful response than I could have hoped for. Um, I may have been a little over ambitious in my ask. Um, actually, was, I got a message a couple days after I published that from uh, Johnny over at French Radio Network. Um, Johnny McMahon, he sent me a message and said, hey, um, I think you might have been a little over ambitious in, in asking for 25 to 50 uh, reviews with feedback. And he was absolutely right about that. Um, I figured, you know, aim high, miss high. Um, but, you know, I still got really high engagement um, from emails uh, and a few reviews as well. But <laughs> at first it was, it was actually kind of disheartening because after, right after I put that out, no joke, I, I checked um, our reviews on Apple podcast and the account actually went down by one. I didn't know that that was a thing you could do, but somebody, maybe it was by mistake um, or maybe it was intentional. I don't know. Maybe somebody deleted uh, a review that had previously been published. Um, so when I saw our account went down, I, I thought, Oh boy, I, I guess, you know, the podcast has run its course. Um, but I checked again a few hours later and there were like four, three or four additional reviews um, in, on top of the one that had been just subtracted. So maybe it was done in mistake. Um, and then on top of that, I just got a flood of emails uh, from folks, like I said. So 
all in all, it was, you know, really positive, really constructive. Folks gave me some really good ideas as well as some good insights as to what they've liked, what type of content they enjoy. I saw some emerging themes and patterns and, um, you know, the people have spoken and I've heard it. So I am going to continue to do the podcast. I'm going to uh, lean into those topics and areas of interest that folks have raised as, you know, the things that they listen and tune into Eschaton for. Uh, some of that was the type of content I've been discussing in the most recent episodes, um, talking about comparative religion and ancient deities um, and, and how they are applicable in the modern world. Some of you are interested in the current events type stuff, although that was a smaller audience. I think a lot of you came here earlier on for a lot of the comparative religion, the, the biblical uh, studies type content and the, the philosophical um, topics and subject matter. Um, so I got a lot of themes around that. A lot of you liked the character bios too, like the John D episode. A lot of folks told me they really liked the Isaac Newton episode. Um, matter of fact, I get a lot of people saying that Isaac Newton was the episode that really turned them on to Eschaton, which um, I don't know how to feel about that because that was really early on and I felt like I didn't know anything about podcasting then. The audio was choppy and terrible. And I'm sure my voice was terrible and the flow was terrible, but I'm glad that you guys overcame all of my shortcomings and made it through that episode and and liked it. So if you could slog through that, I feel like you could slog through anything. So um, I do think I will revisit Isaac Newton at some point in the future. Um, a lot of interesting things I didn't touch on in that episode um, that would be worthwhile. And, you know, I think at this point, <laughs> you guys you guys have earned it. So if you're still listening um, after all these years and you caught that Isaac Newton episode, um, you know, God bless you. And uh, we will revisit him at some point down the road. Um, but again, really quickly before we jump into the podcast today, I just want to say thank you sincerely from the bottom of my heart. Some of you were really candid with me, and I really appreciate that. Even the constructive criticism was was great. I had somebody tell me, you know, there's days where I listen to this podcast and I think, oh, this is great. This is amazing. You know, I need to tell everybody about this. And then I'll listen to the next episode and be like, why do I even listen to this guy? And I, it made me chuckle when I when I heard that because I thought, man, like, you would really get along with my wife and some of my family members um, because I think that's uh, uh, a sentiment that other people share as well. So. I appreciate it. It felt like talking to family. It felt like getting feedback from family. And, um, you know, those of, of us who are interested in topics like these, um, you know, we're a, a subculture. We're, we're a subset of the broader population. Um, they say there's a market for everything. You just got to find your market. And uh, Eschaton isn't a show that's ever going to be in a top 10 list because we talk about things that most people are not interested in and uh, never will be interested in. And that's fine. Um, but for those of you who do, I really do see you as like distant family members um, because, you know, I can talk to you about things that I, I couldn't talk to people in my day-to-day -day life about um, in many cases. So, I really do appreciate the constructive feedback, and for those of you who continue to listen, thank you, and uh, we're on this journey together. So if you have any recommendations, any folks you'd like to have on as guests, I haven't had a guest on in a while, let me know. You can shoot me an email anytime. I'm always open to, to feedback, and I will apply it you know, as, as much as I'm able to do. Um, as far as going forward, you know, like I said, we, we are going to keep the show going. Um, Eschaton's not going to go away. Um, the response was overwhelmingly positive, and um, because of that, we're gonna we're gonna stick around. Um, it will be more kind of as the spirit leads, you know, like as the muses, um, you know, are active. Whatever metaphor you want to use, um, I'm not gonna try to make it a point to put an episode out every two weeks or something like that. Because one, I'll probably not live up to the standard I set for myself, um, and two, um, you know, it just becomes more like a job at that point, and not, you know it's easy to lose interest. So I want to make sure I'm giving you things worth listening to. So however long it takes is how long it'll take. Um, but I will put out episodes, um, you know, as I feel motivated to do it. And as I feel like I have something, you know, worth worthy of your time. Um, I don't want to be, you know, just a windpipe that is occupying airspace. So uh, Eschaton will continue to update. We'll have new content. Like I said, um, thank you so much for the feedback and I'll just leave it at that. Now for today's episode, uh, this is going to be kind of a part two, more like a 1.5 on the last podcast, which was the age of Dionysus. Right after that episode wrapped, I uh, ended up taking a, a, a short trip, um, four days to Greece. I was in Athens and um, explored a little bit of northern Greece and got to see some of these historical sites, including the ruins at Delphi, um, some of the caves um, where historically Pan and the nymphs um, occupied, uh, along with Dionysus. I got to spend a ton of time in Athens, uh, which was amazing. Um, and I figured when I came back, like it was just, it, it was so much new information that I felt like I had to just 
revisit Dionysus before we leave him in the in the past and, and move on to something else. Um, so this isn't going to be a, a more thorough, um, you know, long form follow up to that episode because I think we touched on a lot of it in the last episode. But I wanted to just reemphasize and go a little bit deeper based on some observations I had while I was there. Um, and I thought you guys might find it interesting as well. So today is going to be Dionysus part two, and I hope you enjoy it. So one thing I wanted to emphasize that I didn't really hit on in, in detail in the last episode was the origins of the god Dionysus. So he is thought to have come from Thrace or somewhere in the Carpathian Mountains, which would make sense. Um, he, he was a god of, of wine, the vine, um, party, revelry. You know, these are things that, quote unquote, once upon a time were, you know, considered, you know, pagan practices in, in the modern Eastern Europe. And Dionysus would have had his origins in that space and time. He kind of the quote unquote barbarian culture um, that was competing with the the philosophers of, of Greece and then later the disciplined Romans to the West. Um, so the cult of Dionysus is kind of that chaos, quote unquote, barbarian culture that is clashing with the rational mind of the Apollonians to the West. That's the first thing, um, ge geographically speaking, is that Dionysus is really, in some regards, the antithesis of what came to be known as the rational, grounded, civilized, again, quotes around that word, Westerners. The funny thing is, though, when I got to Athens, I saw that Dionysus was by far, and I, I do mean like it wasn't even close, the most revered god. So those who prized prided themselves as, you know, the most civilized of society, the wisest, the most grounded in reason and rationality. They were the ones who worshipped him the, the most. They, they adored him. It, there were monuments to Dionysus pretty much everywhere. Um, as, as you know, and we did touch on this in the last episode, he's kind of the, the driving force when it comes to the origins of theater, right? So when we talk about performing arts, um, not just drama, but um, music, poetry, um, anything performed on a stage in front of an audience, that has its roots, uh, at least in the West, in the worship of Dionysus. So there were altars to Dionysus everywhere in Athens. And even though the city bears the name of the goddess Athena, I mean, Dionysus is prevalent in every aspect of society there. So I thought that was an interesting observation. And then additionally, when I went to Delphi, which... Um, quick sidebar is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. I mean, the ruins of Delphi are breathtaking. And when you're high at the altitude um, in, in the mountains and you see, you know, the surrounding terrain and all the natural landscape um, and all it has to offer around you, you know, it's really easy to get caught up in the moment and just you know, the natural beauty and order of things. And, and what I found most profound at Delphi was that a lot of worshipers of Dionysus um, made a home there, and they would come there every year for the festival of Dionysus, and they would walk all the way from Athens in many cases. So um, it was like a, a, a parade, so to speak, like groups of, of women. Um, the men would usually be separate, and they would travel together. Um, if they were off at war, then they wouldn't attend. But, um, you know, in general, groups of men would travel to Delphi um, in a caravan and groups of women, and they would start drinking uh, in Athens or southern Greece, uh, Lacedaemonia, wherever they were coming from, and they would go on foot all the way to Delphi um, to partake in the festival of Dionysus. So, I mean, they were really committed to the worship of Dionysus, the god. And in a few minutes, I'll talk about, you know, why that's so profound and, and what actually took place <laughs> during those ceremonies. But um, there were statues of Dionysus literally everywhere you turned. And even in Delphi, uh, where there's a temple dedicated to Apollo, you know, and the oracle of Delphi is an oracle serving on behalf of Apollo and speaking for Apollo. Even there, you see the presence of his counterpart, Dionysus. Um, and the most interesting thing there was the temple itself. So the ruins of the temple um, are scattered all over the, the historical site. There aren't many left. So a couple pillars still standing, but that's really it for the Temple of Apollo. Um, but when it stood, on one side you had a stone carving representation of Apollo and a monument to Apollo, but on the other side of the Temple of Apollo was a representation of Dionysus. I didn't know that um, before I, I went to Delphi, and I thought it was really profound because 
the inscription above the entrance to the Temple of Apollo, as many of you probably know, is nothing in excess and, and know thyself. Those were the two kind of key phrases at Delphi. Nothing in excess is a reference to all things in moderation, basically. It's just a, a, another turn of phrase, but it means the same thing. And there's, you know, for, for me personally, they've always kind of been words to live by, at least as a, as a guidestone, you know, all things in moderation, whatever pleasure you enjoy in life, you know, it can control you if you don't control it, basically, is the, is the driving point there. And that's really what the relationship of Apollo and Dionysus represents. And to the Greeks, the reason why they love Dionysus so much, at least the impression I got, um, you know, seeing these ruins was because he was the representation of, you know, just cutting loose, you know, unwinding, um, being that counterbalance to the overly, you know, thoughtful, rational components of life. Like when you look at their architecture, you know, the Doric columns and very rigid structure of these giant monuments that they built. I mean, it's very Apollonian in the sense that it reflects wisdom, intelligence, prestige. Dionysus is the opposite of that. And, and you can kind of see why the Greeks would have felt like they needed that in their lives. They were just constantly living in a world that was rooted in, in rationality and structured thought. Um, and because of that, you know, Dionysus was a, sort of an escape. And when I brought that back to the modern world in the last episode, what I was trying, trying to get at was how we live in sort of a reactionary time. We live in a time that's a reaction to the, the rigidness the conformity, the morality of the generations that came before us. And now we live, you know, really beginning with the beatniks and then taking off with the hippies in the 60s. Ever since that time, we've lived in this sort of flashing chaos of neon lights and everything in excess and experience to the fullest. I mean, and you can see it in, in almost every metric, like the number of people who, you know, live by so-called traditional values or what we would call Judeo-Christian values that, you know, American society was really built and framed on, is that a decreasing number? I mean, it's still higher than a lot of countries in the Western world, um, at least in lip service terms, um, but it's, it's certainly shrinking. And certainly when you look at, you know, the pleasures that we have available to us and the number of people, you know, who are constantly just consumed by them, whether it's drug addiction, um, you know, sex, music, whatever. I mean, none of these things are negative in and of themselves, but the, the rates of abuse of all of these things is at an all-time high. And that's a reflection of living in a Dionysian age. But anyway, what caught my eye um, and, and what I found so profound in Greece was that they had this recognition. And it, it took me back to Carl Jung's um, concept of the shadow and, and not seeing the shadow as something to be feared or to run away from, but something that you needed to integrate with the rest of your consciousness in order to be a whole man. That's something that really changed my way of thinking a couple of years ago. Um, and I, I, I think it's a much healthier way to perceive our quote unquote dark side, um, rather than trying to vanquish it or, or kill the dragon. Um, we try to respect it and put it in its place, keep a leash on it, so to speak, but integrate it and recognize it as a part of ourselves because there is a place in time for the dragon. Dionysus is that dragon. And the Greeks had a very healthy respect and adoration for him as such. I mean, he's the personification of the chaos, the kundalini, um, the coiled serpent, lust, the, the, the passion, the energy, the kinetic aspect of who we are. Um, he's the opposite of Apollo, is the best way to put it. That was everywhere in Greek society. Um, and what's interesting, you know, is th that it was sort of romanticized in the theatrical world back then. And nowadays, we romanticize the theatrical world. So back then, actors, poets, you know, people of the arts were kind of a, a, on the lower rungs of society. They weren't people um, that you would ever, you know, look to as, as idols, um, people that you would want to aspire to be. Um, they were kind of peculiar, and they were always objects of entertainment, but they were never objects of glorification. That's completely flipped today. I mean, we've we've put Dionysus on the pedestal and lowered Apollo, um, intelligence, reason, discourse, all of these things have been demoted and passions and 
lightheartedness and, and revelry, all those things have been elevated. So it, it's kind of interesting to see like a yin and a yang, how our modern culture is sort of the antithesis of ancient Greece. And maybe that's why there's such a, a draw and such a hunger um, for history nerds um, like, like myself and many of you um, to go see these ruins like in ancient Rome or old city Jerusalem or Greece. I mean, I've been to all three of those sites and it's not by happenstance. I mean, I prioritize three of those, those three sites over most places in the world because they represent a different time, a, a time of um, the mind, a time where men esteemed and valued things differently than we do today. I mean, you look at architecture and you can pretty much tell all you need to know about the values of a society in terms of how they shape their architecture. Uh, architecture. I mean, so today, I think I talked about this in one episode a while back. Like, if you look at the Levittowns in Pennsylvania and New York, I mean, these cookie-cutter homes on, you know, grid diagram form streets where everything's the same. I mean, this is the idea of the American dream, but it's really a reflection of, of, of staleness, not of ingenuity, but of maximizing space, max, maximizing capital, maximizing output, maximizing efficiency. Ancient Greece and Rome were nothing like that. Uh, they were more about you know honor glory beauty prestige timelessness they wanted their architecture to reflect immortality to reflect the highest peaks of human capability and that's why they're so beautiful to see today because they still have that message you know two three thousand years later in some cases and it's not so different in Jerusalem either. I mean, the architecture isn't as grandiose, but the ideas were for sure. And, you know, some of the architecture there, um, you know, tried to be on that scale, especially in the Roman era, obviously. Um, you know, but but just the way men thought and uh, valued um, different aspects of life then is, is sort of an antithesis to where we are now. And I think that's why I've always had a draw to those areas. Um and visiting those areas. So anyway, it was just really interesting to see that in person. Uh, now more than ever, I'm convinced that we live in the age of Dionysus. Um, but I could have never prepared myself for understanding how much even then, you know, he was loved and adored. Um, if, if there's a lesson I could take away from it, it would be this. It would be that Dionysus has always been loved and adored um, in the ancient world and now. Um, the difference is that they knew how to restrain him and how to to moderate um, all the pleasures and joys that come with the worship of Dionysus. We seem to have taken that restraint off and just gone full steam ahead. And, you know, where the... Where the road ends for us, I mean, that story's yet to be written. Um, you know, we could run headlong into a wall and, and fall apart like most cities that have given themselves into their basis desires. Or, you know, maybe maybe there's a different path that that we're navigating. I don't, I don't claim to know where it's going to end. Um, but it is very interesting to see um, how two societies can take two drastically different approaches to um, a concept or an idea that they both admire. So Dionysus, the man, was, you know, he's a... a a god. He was the son of Zeus, a demigod, really. Um, his his mother, Semele, um, I don't know as much about her. And, you know, there's even some debate as to whether or not Semele was actually his mother. So I won't spend too much time on his parentage other than the fact that he was a son of Zeus and he was the godfather of Pan, um, you know, the, a, a god of music and a forest god, um, one who's constantly um, cavorting with the nymphs and also chasing after Aphrodite. Pan is a really interesting character. Um, you know, we get a lot of our modern words, pandemic, pandemonium, um, from from Pan. So he's an, he's another case study that maybe we can touch on at some point in the future, um, probably not anytime soon, but maybe, maybe down the road. He and Dionysus are often depicted together. And when I was at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, I I lost count of the number of um, sculptures that had those two side by side. The story goes that Hermes um, fathered Pan with a, a nymph, and uh, when he was born and he had hooves, um, you know, the goat hooves and the horns, um, his mother was aghast and she disowned him, but Hermes loved his son and he was very proud of him. So he took him to Olympus where Dionysus saw him and said, um, you know, he is all, he is everything. And that's what Pan means, the everything. Uh Dionysus was so so flattered and, and taken away by Pan that he was named his godfather, and the two were basically inseparable after that. So take that for what it's worth. I think the metaphor there is really interesting, though. Like Dionysus, the god of wine, revelry, passion, and partying, uh, the vine and the harvest, like he's paired with 
the everything, <laughs> the, the lustful, uh, the god of the forest, of, of creativity, of, of music, the nymphs. I mean, these two together are basically the height of passion, the, the height of every human joy, every, every pleasure that we you know, put our time and energy into is really summed up in those two. Um, so I, I really found that interesting. Now, I touched on this in the last episode, and I wanted to re- revisit this just briefly. Um, Friedrich Nietzsche's concept of Greek mythology and basically distilling everything down to Apollo and Dionysus. Nietzsche said that of all of Greek mythological figures, there were really only two that were of any consequence, and those were Apollo and Dionysus. Uh, For the reasons that I mentioned, you know, they represent that dichotomy um, between rationality and impulse, structure and discipline versus, you know, chaos and, and frivolousness. So I basically agreed with that in the last episode. And I said, you know, it made made sense to me, and I really did think Nietzsche was onto something there. I still think he was mostly correct after spending a little bit of time in Greece, but I would just add one caveat. Um, After being in Athens, I would add a third to that mix, and that would be the goddess, Pallas Athena. I think that Athena uh, really serves as the bridge between Apollo and Dionysus, and she cannot be left out. Um, so in any tradition, I mean, obviously you can take these terms, Apollo and Dionysus, and you can you know plug them in however you want um, in your religion or, or your tradition, um, good and evil, light and darkness, the yin and the yang, whatever you want to call it, sin and obedience. Uh, I, th- there's probably some, some wiggle room for interpretation there. But in any case, the third component that's often less left out is Athena goddess of wisdom and the representation of athena which is all over athens is the owl the owl being a symbol of wisdom is associated with athena and what uh, a tour guide put together for me while i was on the acropolis um, and also in delphi was that you know athena was sort of seen as the interpretation of or the way of discerning. I guess discernment is a better word than interpretation. The discernment between the two. So Apollo ruled more supremely than Dionysus, meaning that he governed a larger portion of day-to-day life. Because if you live according to Dionysus, I mean, you'll never get anything done. Things will fall apart, and society won't flourish. You'll never grow into a you know great empire. Dionysus there's a reason why he comes in, in late stage empire as opposed to the beginnings of an empire. Athena was the representation of wisdom to know when to balance between the two and to discern between them. So basically the message at Delphi, nothing in excess, cannot be lived out in any sort of practical way without recognizing the place that the goddess plays in this you know, Greek trinity. It really has to be Athena sort of occupying the equivalent of what would be maybe the Holy Spirit, the wisdom, the interpretation uh, between Apollo, the father, and Dionysus, the son. Uh, I mean, this is it's probably blasphemy <laughs> for me to say it that way, um, but I don't mean it as any sort of direct comparison. I'm just trying to you know, paint a picture um, for those who prefer visual references. That's the way I see sort of the, the trichotomy there in, in Greek myth. So, the wisdom of Athena allows one to know when to live according to the principles of Dionysus and when they should follow after Apollo. When to be reserved, when to be rational, and when to cut loose, basically. And there is a place and time for all of it. For a while, I think the Greeks mastered it. But then, like so many societies before and after, they lost control. And you see that in the architecture. Dionysus just took over. And when Dionysus took over, everything sort of went downhill. It wasn't overnight, but you can see it gradually from the ancient era to the classical era, all the way up to, you know, the Romanization of of Greece. They eventually just fell into the pages of history. Some of that was external. I mean, the invasions of the Persians, then you had the Peloponnesian Wars, uh, but you had a lot of internal destruction. And what really got me is like sitting up on Areopagus Hill or Mars Hill um, in Roman times um, where the Apostle Paul went when he came through Athens and, you know, began preaching Christ and the gospel to the to the men of Athens. You know, you can kind of see his perspective and where he would have been coming from because he was seeing Athens at a time of just complete Dionysian usurpation. I mean, Dionysus 
at that point, I, I can imagine, you know, first century AD, um, this is Roman era, you know, by then he's going by Bacchus, but still the concept is the same. You know, he's seeing, he's seeing the ruins because even then, I mean, the ruins of Greece were old. You go back to the Mycenaean era, that's 11, 1200 years before the time of Paul. The classical era was 500 years before him. So it's like us looking at Renaissance architecture today. I mean, so Paul's seeing the ruins of that. He's seeing what the consequences of giving yourself over to your passions is, what it can do. And he's preaching to the people in the context of that. And that really awoken something in me in terms of just intellectual understanding. It's just, you know, you see this rhyming pattern in history, um, to quote for the millionth time on this podcast, Mark Twain, who said history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. I mean, I think Paul was probably thinking something like that while he sat on the Areopagus overlooking Athens, because I mean, there was once a culture of, of great prominence there. I mean, giants, men who were basically, you know, intellectual giants came out of that place. Aristotle, Socrates, Pericles, Solon. I mean, there were, there were so many, too many to count. And then what happened? You know, it all fell apart. So it's the same old story, um, you know, the story that we're living through right now in the modern West. Um, the names just change, but, you know, the story stays the same. So all that to say that seeing Athens and seeing Greece just confirmed a lot of what we talked about in the last episode. And I really encourage you, if you haven't been there, you know, to do a historical tour there yourself. Um, and you'll see what I mean. I mean, Dionysus is everywhere in the ancient world, and he just becomes more prominent with time. So you can kind of see how Apollo was just usurped gradually over the centuries and how that factored into, you know, every facet of life. The sexual expressions, I mean, are very explicit in their pottery. Um, uh, <laughs> I won't talk about it on the podcast um, so I can keep a clean rating here. But, um, yeah, very explicit, you know, and all that's rooted in the worship of Dionysus um, and his festivals. So um, when I say the festival of Dionysus, basically, just to be clear, it's basically just an orgy. Um, it's an annual orgy where everybody, you know, just got completely drunk, cut loose. Many put on masks. Some would dress as minotaurs or centaurs. Um, some of them would, you know take their slaves and parade, uh, parade them around in, in royal garb and others would dress as slaves and basically they would just change roles for the day. They would sleep with people that, you know, they otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to sleep with and everybody just cut loose. I mean, it was a great time for like a week. I mean, it, it wasn't just a once a year thing like we celebrate holidays. It would go on for days. Um, and the Festival of Dionysus, I mean, if you need an example, you know, if, in history, just, you know, go read Herodotus or Thucydides. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear what was happening at these events and the Romans, I mean, known for their strict discipline and order, they actually outlawed the fest, the festival of Bacchus for a time, uh, for that reason, they thought it was just creating depravity and immorality among the people. So it was outlawed. I think, don't quote me on this. It was around 160 AD. Um, it was outlawed for a time. Even then <laughs> it was understood that Dionysus was the dragon that needed to be restrained. Um, but he's a good time. I mean, the guy is a lot of fun, and it, no bones about it, he is my favorite uh, figure in, in the Greek pantheon, hands down. Um, but he needs to be balanced uh, with Athena um, as the countermeasure between himself and Apollo. The last thing I wanted to touch on in this episode was just the profound weight that the words of uh, the Apostle John in the New Testament kind of... Uh, carried after I left Athens. So especially after seeing the museums, all of the artifacts, um, the, the craftsmanship, the statues, the coins, all of that was carried away um, largely by the Persians and then by the British who plundered it um, when, when they started colonizing every, every place on the planet. They took everything back to the British Museum. Um, so a lot of it's not there anymore, but much of it's been returned. So a lot of these statues and monuments are in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, which is the most amazing history museum I've ever seen hands down. Um, so if you ever get a chance to go there, you just go into the halls of um, the statues and you'll see what I mean. But the words of the Apostle John, um, little children beware of idols. I mean, that just hit a different chord when I saw it. I mean, even if you're not a Christian or you don't come from a Christian discipline or, or background or a Jewish background, I should say, um, it, it'll still resonate with you. Like you'll understand like, the difference between Eastern and Western worship is very clearly on display in the architecture of, of ancient Greece. Um, and with the Hebrews, you know, 
never putting a physical form to their God, Yahweh or El, you know, you can imagine how overwhelmed or just culture shocked they would be seeing a place like Athens. And that's why, you know, I think they, they emphasize so much not giving yourself over to idols. Like even in the New Testament, when, when the Apostle Paul, I was just reading through the book of Acts recently, and I had to revisit some of it when I got back from Greece because a lot of it takes place there. But when Paul and Peter are talking about like what, rules and guidelines should we give to the Gentiles? He bas- They basically all agree, like, we don't want to put the yoke of the law around them because we couldn't even keep the the law of Moses. Like, we're not going to put the Levitical code on the Gentiles as well, or nobody's going to believe. They basically tell them to abstain from immorality and not partake in anything offered to idols. And I always kind of brushed off that offered to idols part reading that for years as I was like, yeah, whatever. That's like a thing of the ancient world where, you know, the Babylonians worshiping Marduk. I picture something like that or the Egyptians and the golden calf. No, that's, that's not limited to that. I mean, it's literally everywhere. And in the modern world, it's just taken a different form, but it was just blatantly obvious seeing there that everything was offered to idols. I mean, there was a statue and a replica. Every Every corner you turned, there was a statue or a replica to some god or some idol. And I think that's why it it sort of dawned on me there, um, but I've thought about it a lot more since I got home. I think that's why the message of Christianity and why why Judaism, um, even more so, have remained um, intact in a somewhat traditional form for so long, especially Judaism. So not having a physical representation of your God is probably the most powerful thing any society can do. Because once you you try to personify a deity or put them in a human form, they are bound by that form. And this is why in the ancient world, you know, whether it's the God Dagon or, as I said, Marduk or, you know, you name it, plug and play, Baal, any of these, if you captured their likeness, captured their their idol, their statue, I mean, you could literally be perceived as holding that God captive. And sometimes it would, you know, be a matter of diplomatic importance to get a God returned to his patron city. The Jews never had to deal with this. I mean, the closest thing they came to similarly was kind of the worship of the temple. Um, And eventually it was leveled, you know, twice. Um, Or Antiochus Epiphanes going into the Holy of Holies. I mean, that's pretty much the closest they came. Um, But even then, it wasn't a personification of their God. I mean, they had the cherubs upon the Ark of the Covenant, and they had this temple that they idolized. Um, So they flirted with it. But you can see how every other religion completely gave itself over to it. And it's no coincidence that almost all of these pantheons are now defunct or basically extinct. I mean, yeah, there are still people that worship the old gods even now in Greece and uh, Scandinavia and and places like that. But they're a very small minority, and it's more of like a culturally trendy thing because that just seems to be in right now. Um, Not to demean, you know, the true believers, but there's a reason why those things all failed because people saw the limitations of their gods and how their gods were basically just metaphors for themselves and all of the vices and all the virtues that they themselves possessed. Yahweh never had that. Yahweh was always kept separate. And that's why I think the gospel message with Christ later on resonated so much with, with people in, in Europe. I mean, a God that's perceived not as, the ideal human being in physical form, but more comely and and weak to the point where he was crucified and then resurrected. I mean, this this is a very foreign concept to anything in Greece. That's why Paul was so shrewd when he, you know, see he says, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all things. And as I was passing through, I saw a monument to the unknown God. And he basically, you know, uses that as his his in. That's his way to get into them. And he says, you know, this is the God that I present to you now. And then he goes on to tell them the gospel message. And it's a really shrewd way to approach it because you have to understand religion and religious worship for them wasn't just a, 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 a component of faith. It was livelihood. I mean, many of them, every aspect of their, their life, um, their income was rooted in the worship of the gods. Many were builders or architects, storytellers. I mean, whatever you were, a potter, everything was going to come back to the gods in one way or another because all of the architecture, all the artwork was rooted in deities. There was no separation of church and state. That was a completely foreign concept. Anyway, all that to say, this beware of idols concept um, is a trap that 
religions have fallen into time and time again throughout history. And Christianity is no exception to it. The thing that resonated most with me when I got home was how Christianity has yeah, kind of been co-opted over time. I, it, around the time of Constantine and when Christianity became embraced by the Roman elites to usurp the Roman pantheon and become the faith of the nation or the faith of the empire, it started to take on all those traits of idol worship. And you see it still today. I mean, the, the Byzantines were, were no different from the classical Greeks in that regard, from the frescoes and the sculptures of, you know, the Madonna and the infant Jesus. I mean, this was basically just taking their pagan deities and just re redoing the faces with Mary and Jesus. I mean, truly no difference. And, and in the modern day, I mean, our temples and our cathedrals and the the lavishness, the extravagance, it's no different than the Acropolis and the, and the Parthenon. I mean, it's it's literally the same pitfalls that they fell into then. Uh, wearing crucifixes around our necks and having statues of Jesus. I mean, it's no different than statues to Zeus or Poseidon or Athena. All of it is the same, and it's rampant in Christianity. Christianity has fallen into the exact same trap of the, the religions that they looked down upon to their West 2,000 years ago. And I just find that to be very interesting and, and ironic at the same time. Now, the Jews, you know, the, the Hebrews, before them, they never fell into that, and they still haven't now. I mean, say what you will about Judaism as a religion— um, <laughs> but, but it's been true in that regard that they have never been corrupted by idols, at least not to the extent of anybody else. Muslims would probably be a close second in, in that regard. I mean, you could argue that you know the pilgrimage to Mecca and the Kaaba and, and all that you know are a form of idol worship, but I mean, that's peanuts compared to what you see in Christianity and have seen in Christianity for the greater part of 1,700 years now. So... Beware of idols is something that we should all take to heart, and that's kind of my takeaway from from Greece. Uh, idols will not only destroy your religion over time, but it'll destroy your culture because your society just completely given over to idols will will turn to dust as those idols turn to dust. Nothing made of human hands can endure forever. That's a secret that the Jews seem to understand in almost every other religion. It just cannot overcome the temptation to commoditize their faith, Christianity included the faith which I'm part of. So um, it's disheartening on one hand, but um, you know, also enlightening. So I think we all need to just be diligent and mindful to just in our daily lives, just try to st steer clear of idols. And you're not, you can romanticize that or you can um, spiritualize it to say an idol is, you know, anything you put in your heart before God and, and whatnot. I mean, I always heard that growing up, like, Anything can be an idol. Money can be an idol. Sex can be an idol. And, and that's prob that's true in one way. But no, I, I mean it in the literal sense, like physical idols, like actual stone or alabaster. <laughs> like it's much more rampant than you think. Um, and, and I'm actually guilty of it. I left Athens with three little statues, <laughs> one of Dionysus, one of Apollo, and one of Athena. And they sit above one of my bookshelves right outside of where I'm recording this right now. Um, I'm not praying to them or worshiping them. So, I, I mean, I hope, <laughs> you know, my God would understand and not judge me as an idol worshiper for it. Um, I, I have them as a sort of a, a memorial. It's, it's a reminder of myself to, you know, have the wisdom of Athena, the metaphor of Athena, um, as that balance between my light and my darkness, my rationality and my chaos, to know that there's a place for both of those things in my life, but they need to be balanced by wisdom. It's basically just a physical representation of nothing in excess or all things in moderation. Um, you know, but it's very, very easy for something like that to become an idol if you're not mindful of it. I know there's no religious application of it for me personally, but it's a very small step away um, for it to become um, a personification of a God in my life. So I just wanted to bring that back home to remind you that Greece is a reminder that no matter what heights mankind climbs to, we are never free from the superstition and the idolatry of our ancestors. They were just as smart as us in every way. Uh, we should not belittle them or assume that we have surpassed them in, in any way. We stand on the shoulders of giants just as they did. Um, and we may stand a little taller today, um, but we are no better than they are and no more enlightened than they were. And I see so many of the pitfalls that 
consumed them and cost them their civilizations and their their lives in many cases. I see them today all around us and, and prevalently within my myself, my own being. And that's the greatest gift that the Greek myths give you. I mean, just being surrounded and immersed in the myths for a few days in Greece was refreshing in a way because obviously I don't believe those stories literally. I think many of them were built upon and borrowed from other civilizations, from you know the Egyptians, the Sumerians, the Babylonians. There's a reason why these pantheon gods are all very similar. They Many of them have similar source stories that were transferred from one culture to the next. So obviously I don't believe the stories literally um, in their final form, but I do think the stories they tell are literally true in the sense that they tell us about ourselves. The gods are like looking into a mirror. When we read the stories of Zeus and Poseidon and Dionysus, we are reading a story of us. We're reading a story that tells us the best things about who we are as people and the worst things about us as people. It tells us that we need to moderate our passions. It tells us that we need to pursue virtues and and live to live and strive to live a, a balanced life. Arate, you know, we've talked about in this podcast, excellence in all things. Those are the lessons from the myths and the stories that were ingrained in the Greco-Roman world. And those truths are timeless, and they're still just as applicable today. So to wrap up Dionysus for good here, I just want to say lastly in this in this part two that you know he is just as prevalent, just as esteemed, just as loved in the modern world as he was 2,500 years ago in classical Greece. I mean... Everything about our society is Dionysian. We may have forgotten his name. We may call it something else. We may call it many different things, but it's Dionysus, and there's no escaping it. So do yourself a favor. If you ever get the chance, go over to Greece, explore the historical ruins of Athens and Delphi, and see for yourself what the power of ideas and the power of passions does to a man and how it can manifest itself in the physical world. Because it's truly no different than the manifestations that we have in the modern world. The only difference is that our technology is better. Now you can get Dionysus in your living room on demand with a swipe of a finger. (laughs) God help us all. All right, guys, that'll do it for this one. This is a little bit uh, less structured and and off the cuff. Again, I just wanted to do that follow-up, let you know the podcast is is here to stay. Um, Again, I'm not going to emphasize timelines. I'm going to just research topics that I think you'll find interesting and when I feel like I'm ready to record them I will and I'll put them out there for you not expecting you know any contributions anymore in terms of the patreon page or anything like that the only thing I ask is that you just you know spread the word about the podcast Um, it has been great getting a response um, seeing download numbers go up uh, once again and you know I actually had a couple folks reach out about um, ad opportunities um, for the podcast so I'd never at least since the early days when it was growing really fast. I haven't gotten an ad request um, in a long time. I'm not going to do it um, just because I think it would kind of muddy the waters a little bit and there's not much value in doing so. I'm not going to promote some product for a couple trinkets. Um, But it's just good to see that, you know, there's an interest in that again. So um, thank you all. For those of you who have turned other people onto the podcast, thank you so much. Um, What I set out to do when I started this podcast over four years ago, five years ago now, wow, time flies. What I set out to do was just connect people of like-minded ideas. You know, I have like two or three people in my personal life who have any interest in the things we talk about in this podcast. So I'm not exaggerating when I say you guys are really like um, distant family members and, and, and friends. So I enjoy talking to all of you. I appreciate the emails. I appreciate the input. And um, I'll do my best to give you things worth listening to, ideas to think about and ponder. And uh, hopefully we can continue the dialogue. Um, you know how to reach me on social media. Uh, there's still an Eschaton podcast page on Facebook. You can find it by searching Eschaton podcast. There's a group there. Um, I do have a Twitter page that I almost never post to, but you can find it at Eschaton podcast on Twitter, um, where we have a very, very small following. Um, and you can always reach me by email, josh at joshuawisely.com or jwisely7 at gmail.com. That's it for me today. And, um, again, thank you all for your input. Thank you for your dedication. And, um, your patience with me over the years. I really appreciate every single person who's taken the time to reach out and just say, Hey, you know, keep it up or just drop an encouraging word when maybe I'm not motivated to do the podcast anymore. It's good to know that there are other people out there who who share a similar disposition and a similar curiosity about the world. So thank you all. Talk to you guys soon. Take care. Be well.